Hello and welcome to the History on Fire YouTube channel. The video you're checking out now is actually audio only. It comes from a History on Fire podcast episode, so it's exactly like the podcast. However, this is not the only kind of thing that I'll be publishing here on YouTube. I'll also have videos that, are, uh, that combine my narration of a historical event with images. So please explore all the offerings on this channel, subscribe to it, and hit like to the videos you enjoy. And thank you so much for your support. Whether you like history or not, if you care about bravery, wisdom, passion, larger than life characters, and some of the most emotionally intense moments in human experience, you have come to the right place. Daniele Bellelli is a university history professor, writer, and martial artist, and he shall be your guide in a journey to the place where history and epic collide. This is the second in a multi-part series dedicated to the life of Lakota leader Crazy Horse in specific, and the conflict between the US and tribes on the Great Plains in general. It's probably a wise idea to check out the previous episode before you get started on this one, so that the events narrated here will make more sense. As I mentioned also in my first episode of this series, this whole series is dedicated to the memory of my friend James Weddell from the Yankton Sioux tribe. Without further ado, let's go set history on fire. Following the 1864 Sand Creek Massacre, the Lakota and Cheyenne were out for blood. Revenge was on everybody's mind. There are quite a few Lakota, Cheyenne and even Arapaho who were living in the Southern Plains who decided to post Sun Creek to rejoin their northern relatives in order to form a united front in fighting against the United States. The American army tried to stop these uh, southern tribesmen from joining their northern kin, but they were hopelessly outmatched when it came to their maneuvering, and they managed to somehow miss thousands of them moving across the plains until they eventually did rejoin. Right after this, the raids began. Uh, in Wyoming, in parts of the Dakotas, all over the northern plains, Lakota, Cheyenne and Arapa warriors will launch a series of attacks in what's the first salvo in what some historians refer to as the Red Cloud War, which went from roughly 1865 through 1868. Now, where does this name come from? Red Cloud as we're going to see, is going to be an extremely important character, not just in this episode, but during the entire, really during all of the episodes that we're going to be doing about Crazy Horse. He's going to be there from this point forward, playing a fairly important role in, in multiple junctures. In some ways, this uh, calling this conflict the Red Cloud War is, it really is a mistake. It's historians kind of overestimating the importance that Red Cloud has. Having said that, this is not to say that Red Cloud was not an extremely important leader in this conflict. He was one of the key chiefs who will play a leading role during this conflict with the United States in the mid to late 1860s. Red Cloud had a bit of a controversial past. And as we will see in the upcoming episodes, he'll also have a bit of a controversial future. He was born in the early 1820s, and he had become famous not only due to his skills as a warrior in intertribal warfare, but also as a result of an ugly episode that had pit Lakota against Lakota. There were two rival leaders by the name, one named Smoke, 
and the other one named Bull Bear. And Red Cloud was a follower of Smoke. And during the conflict between them, he had uh, walked up to Bull Bear during a fight that had broken out between the two bands and shot him in the head. So, usually, somebody who's responsible for the killing of another tribal member within the same tribe, there are usually repercussions that go with it. Now, Red Cloud hadn't suffered that much about it, but he did show that he was willing and able, if need be, to shed Lakota blood. And this theme of the internal fighting among the Lakota will show up again and again in the course of Red Cloud's life. In any case, Red Cloud, as well as several other Lakota and Cheyenne leaders, decided that in the summer of 1865 they will strike a blow against the Platt Bridge Station, which was located near modern-day Casper, Wyoming. There was a garrison and a fort, roughly about 100 soldiers or so living there, were guarding the crossing of the North Platte River, which was the location where most American travelers trying to head west would use to cross the river. One day in July of 1865, the soldiers had noticed a couple of warriors cutting down telegraph wires. They also knew that there was a supply train coming with about 25 soldiers escorting it. So the combination of seeing these uh, warriors' activity in taking down telegraph lines, as well as the understanding that the supply train was due any minute now, led the soldiers at the garrison to decide to send a few of them out to check what the warriors were doing and to also provide an escort for the supply train. So a lieutenant by the name of Casper Collins led some troops out of the garrison to meet the train. Now, Collins was an interesting character. He had often camped with friendly Lakota. He had hanged out with them and had been fairly friendly with them. In this occasion, however, things are going to turn sour. He and the soldiers notice the warriors that have been taking down the telegraph wires and give chase to them. However, the warriors lead them into an ambush. Uh, where there's a much larger group of Lakota and Cheyenne waiting for them. Now, the Lakota had tried to spare him because they recognized him, they knew who he was, and they actually liked him. They didn't want to kill him. But the Cheyenne warriors didn't know him, so they promptly filled him with arrows, as well as four other soldiers with him. At this point, let's remember, we're talking, you know, yes, we're discussing Lakota, U.S. history, but we're also focusing on Crazy Horse. Where was Crazy Horse in all of this? Crazy Horse was one of the young warriors that now turned toward the supply train that was incoming to try to stop it and take everything they had. Upon seeing Crazy Horse and many other Lakota and Shen warriors coming toward them, the soldiers that were part of this uh, supply train promptly set up their wagons in a circle. You know, picture the almost stereotypical image that you get in Western movies where Indians attack and uh, the, uh, the Americans set up their wagons in a circle to serve as a barrier. And then, uh, you know, you see the native side circling around trying to shoot at the soldiers hiding behind the wagons. Part of the tactic, too, what the Lakota and Cheyenne were doing in running around was trying to make them waste bullets. The idea was, we are going to dash on our horses as fast as possible in a circle around these wagons. The soldiers are going to just play target practice and try to shoot us. Incidentally, Lakota and Cheyenne were some of the best horsemen in the world at this time. These guys could... Uh, hang on from uh, the neck of their horse with one arm as they would hide their body completely on the other side so you wouldn't even see them you just see the horse and yet these guys would be able to shoot from underneath the neck of the horse so you have a, basically an invisible target however who's shooting back at you this is how good these guys were on horseback so they play this game for a while until the soldiers start running short of ammunition and at this point, they decide for a frontal charge, trying to overwhelm their defenses. This charge is very successful. 
and uh, pretty much all of the soldiers, there's some 25 of them with the, with the supply train, almost all of them are killed, only, only two of them manage to escape and survive. So this was the first post-Sand Creek blow that the alliance of Cheyenne and Lakota struck against the US Army. Speaking of the US Army, the Army was in a curious predicament at this time. Just a few years earlier, in 1862, gold had been discovered in Montana, and the following year, in 1863, a man by the name of John Bozeman had discovered a more direct overland route to the gold fields. The Lakota had not been too pleased with it, because the Bozeman Trail cut right through their best hunting grounds. Yet most American citizens were not exactly concerned with that, so they wanted to be able to get to the gold fields in Montana, and they asked the government to do something about it, to make the Bozeman Trail safe for them to get to Montana. Problem was that the government was quite overstretched by now. This is the time when uh, civil war was going on, and then even immediately after the end of the civil war, what you had was the fact that the reconstruction kind of sucked up a whole lot of the federal budget at this time. The federal government was putting so many resources in the South for reconstruction that they did not really have a whole lot of money left to invest in the army. So there was a whole debate going on regarding the army in Congress. On one end, you had the, the, some radical Republicans who wanted the army to be as big as possible in order to enforce a reconstruction. There were some Western politicians who couldn't care less about reconstruction, but they also wanted a big army in order to protect American citizens from, the, um, from native tribes. There were other people, however, who did not really care about having a big army. What they cared most was about reducing taxes. So they were in favor of reducing the size of the army because they said, look, we have no money. We can't keep growing an army when we have no money. President Johnson was in this latter group. He was for the less taxes, let's shrink the army. So the army was not funded in the best possible way at this time. And yet the discovery of gold in Montana was, was kind of the siren call, you know, it was calling American settlers there. Whether the army was there to protect them or not, people would go anyway. And at that point, Congress would feel that they had to do something about it, that they would have to protect them from Indian attacks. In the words of Nicholas Black Elk, the subject of the very famous book Black Elk Speaks, the Washichus, Washichus is the Lakota term for white people, the Washichus had found much of the yellow metal that they worship and that makes them crazy. And they wanted to have a road up through our country to the place where the yellow metal was. But my people did not want the road. He would scare the bison and make them go away. In this quick quote, Black Elk basically captures what the whole conflict is about. White Americans want to have access to the gold. Lakota don't want them to have access to the gold, not because they care about the gold, but because he would scare off the bison. Now, despite the fact that the army wasn't so well financed, they did find the money to finance an operation by... General Connor. Connor had precise orders to go through the plains, find any hostile Indians, and uh, literally kill every male above the age of 12. So this was, you know, the plan was pretty clear. Early on, like in August, he had a little bit of success. Actually, his pony scouts had a little bit of success. They found some 20 plus Lakota warriors and killed them. But other than that, they were not having such an easy time finding the Lakota and Cheyenne. There was one moment in early September of 1865 when the Lakota and the Cheyenne, some of them at least, were camped together having a Sundance ceremony. So people were participating in this religious ceremony, which I may describe in more detail at the moment. Right now, let's just, let's just say they're having a ceremony. We'll get more into what the Sundance means at a later date. In any case, they were in this camp when they heard that Connor and his troops were close. So in an effort to protect 
the main camp and give it time, give time to the women and children to take down the tipis, hitch them to their horses and get going. Many of the warriors went forward to face with Connor. And the story goes that Crazy Horse said, uh, there's, there's a quote attributed to Crazy Horse in this instance, and it goes something like this. The soldiers like to shoot. I'm going to give them a chance to do all the shooting they want. So what he did is he hopped on his horse and he made three runs front and back right in front of Connor troops. You know, all the soldiers shot, shot up at him, tried to hit him, and they all missed. Uh, there's another Cheyenne leader by the name of Roman Nose who also did one run. This is, in some way, if you guys remember the beginning of the movie Dances with Wolves, this is probably where the idea for that initial scene come from. There's a scene where the character played by Kevin Costner does this semi-suicidal run on a horse going in front of the enemy lines. Probably this was taken from uh, the life of Crazy Horse since he was renowned for doing this stuff multiple times in his life and this is one of the times when he does this. After this uh, big show by Crazy Horse and a few guys, they really didn't have much of a battle. They more faced off with each other. The native side managed to get their camp moving and away from the soldiers, and that was that. For the rest of the summer, Connor had a rather hard time finding any natives. He did score one victory at the end of August, where he found the Arapaho camp and uh, killed quite a few people there. But other than that, he spent a lot of time chasing ghosts around the plains, since he just could not find the tribes. In his reports, Connor highly inflated Indian casualties, but there really is very little evidence that other than in his attack on the Arapaho village were there any casualties, period. So this summer campaign did not do wonders to inspire Congress to open up the purse. The army was requesting more troops, more supplies, to the tune of something in the neighborhood of what in today's money would be $3.2 billion. And Congress, their response was like, are you guys crazy? You know, A, we don't have that kind of money. B, even if we did have it, you guys are wasting it because you haven't really accomplished much. In Congress, they were actually pretty angry with how much this 1865 Connor campaign had costed and how little results it had yielded. By 1866, some Lakota leaders were willing to entertain negotiations with representatives from the US government regarding the possibility of negotiating a peace talk. So there were leaders such as Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, Man Afraid, and a few others agreed to meet at Fort Laramie to see what the US government had to offer. Spotted Tail in particular like, clearly shifted toward the peace faction. He had entertained fairly good relations with some of the soldiers at Fort Laramie. Story goes that his own daughter by the name of Brinks Water, she was a teenager and she supposedly was infatuated with one of the officers at Fort Laramie. She may have had uh, an affair with him. Regardless, we know that she had died of disease in 1866 and had asked uh, that her body be taken at Fort Laramie. So this tells something about the fact that not all Lakota were gango uh, fighting against the United States, but some of them were still trying to work out some kind of deals with the government. What the government wanted was simple now. They wanted the Lakota to allow American citizens to travel to the gold fields in Montana. So they sit down at Fort Laramie, they meet with some of these Lakota and Cheyenne leaders, they are telling them, hey, we're, if you let our citizens get to Montana, we will give you this, that, and the other. They are making all these promises, but right in the middle of negotiations, a whole group of soldiers under an officer by the name of Carrington arrives at the fort and the Lakota are wondering, what are these guys doing here? What do they want? And they find out that Carrington was tasked with building a whole series of forts all along Bosman Trail. 
So the Lakotas are saying, wait, let's take a time out here. You are asking us permission to go onto this trail. But while you are here negotiating, supposedly in good faith, about, oh, we want your permission, we'll give you this and that, you have already made plans to build a whole series of forts along the trail and you're sending them ahead. What are you doing? You know, you're asking permission now, except they have already decided to go ahead regardless of what we say. So clearly that those negotiations don't work out so well and uh, they eventually break down. In a moment of wild optimism, the Indian Affairs Superintendent had written in his report to Washington, satisfactory treaty concluded with the Sioux and Cheyenne. Most cordial feeling prevails. This was just downright ridiculous in the sense that, yeah, he did manage to get a few Lakota and Cheyenne to put pen to paper and sign their willingness to let travelers use the Bozeman Trail. But the reality is that the vast majority of Lakota and Cheyenne had not signed this treaty, would not honor it. And even among the people who were there gathered to sign this treaty, quite a few of them had stormed off the second they had seen Carrington coming in with his troops. Red cloud among them. The ones that did sign, incidentally, were not the ones who lived in the Powder River country, in the, in the Montana area where the Bozeman Trail went through. So, I mean, of course, these guys are willing to sign a treaty permitting a road in a place where they don't live. So that seems a little ridiculous in more ways than one. This guy we mentioned, Carrington, deserves a couple of words. He, he had a low degree from Yale that he had obtained in 1847. He had been a big Republican Party organizer and had served even as uh, Lincoln's bodyguard during a stop in Ohio when Lincoln was traveling through. He had received a political appointment to the army as, um, as colonel of the 18th Infantry, but he had not served in the field. Instead, he had been assigned to recruit, organize, and move the militia from Indiana and Idaho during the Civil War. In this, he had been pretty good. He had recruited over 200,000 people. However, quite a few people didn't like him too much because they felt that he had enjoyed the preferential treatment and that he was, uh, you know, many of the officers that had served, uh, some of the guys who had served in bloody battles did not see Carrington as truly having served in the Civil War. They said, well, that's nice that you supported the war effort with recruiting and supplies and this and that, but you weren't there when the bullets were flying. So there was a bit of tension between Carrington and some of the officers in his own troops. By summer 1866, the Lakota and Cheyenne started a series of raids along the forts that were built along the Bozeman Trail. Uh, Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Young Man Afraid, a few of these leaders played a prominent role in this constant raiding going on. So Carrington established some rules for any traveler that was planning to use the Bosman Trail. The rules went something like this. Nobody would be allowed to use the train unless uh, they are part of a series of wagons that will count at least 30 armed men among them. And very quickly, due to the increasing nature of the raids, he revised this number to 40. He said, if you have less than 40 armed men with you, don't bother using the Bosman Trail. It's flat out illegal and you will be punished if you do. In the meantime, in native camps, Red Cloud and a few other leaders, Crazy Horse going along with them, negotiated a peace with the Crows and visited the Crow tribe. Imagine how weird it is, you know, these guys have been killing each other and they are literally, here you have some Lakota warriors visiting a crow camp where probably quite a few people in that camp can remember when a year or two or three before those very warriors that are now guests in their camp had killed some of their family members and probably vice versa. So this was needless to say a tense meeting. Why were they having it at all? Well, the Lakotas were pitching an idea to the Crows. They were saying, look, if you join us, we forget about our previous fights, you join us. We'll give you some hunting grounds back, some of the land that we've been taken from you, 
and in exchange you help us out in fighting against the U.S. Army. Some young Crow warriors were willing to go. Some of them, despite the fact that on one hand they hated Crazy Horse because he had built a reputation for killing some crows, they also liked him because of his bravery and they considered him kind of the toughest warrior they knew. But despite this, the old leaders of the tribe decided, eh, not so much. A peace with the Lakota? No, we don't like you guys. If it's between you and the US, we like the US better, so not gonna happen. So in the meantime, Red Cloud sends a war pipe inviting all camps of the Lakota and Cheyenne to join in this attack. Uh, just because I haven't explained it, this idea of a war pipe is that you would visit villages with this uh, pipe and you would pitch this talk saying, hey, join us in the war. And if people agreed, then the leaders would smoke the pipe together. The pipe has a, it's both a symbol and a key element in Lakota religion. The smoking of the pipe, there's a whole mythology about it. There's a whole story. You really cannot overestimate the symbolic importance of the pipe. So if people agreed to a course of action and they sat down and smoked the pipe together, that's the equivalent of swearing an oath. It was like a sacred thing that you could... It was more than just giving your word. It was really just this super sacred thing that you could not break. So in sending the war pipe, that's what it means. You are essentially inviting people to join in war. And if they agree, they have to smoke the pipe together and thereby swearing on it. Crazy Horse mentor, High Backbone, accepted the pipe for the Minneconju and joined Red Cloud. This is one of the times when Crazy Horse and Red Cloud have the best relationship that they will ever have. It's not going to last very long, but for the time being, Crazy Horse is often sits in the place of honor next to Red Cloud. Red Cloud kind of uses Crazy Horse charisma and popularity among the young warriors as a recruiting tool. And at the same time, Red Cloud has this position as this sort of wiser, elder statesman, and he's the guy who's in some way leading this charge. Having said that, though, leading the charge does not, again, does not mean that Red Cloud was it, was the only guy. He certainly was an important leader in this conflict, but as a Lakota warrior by the name of Hans the Enemy. Now that's a name for you. Uh, what's your name? Hans the Enemy. That's pretty impressive. In any case, what he said was, there was no one person in charge of the Indians. Meaning, yes, there were important leaders, but there was no single leader who everybody agreed uh, he was the man and they would have to everybody to listen. There were many important leaders who joined forces for this fight. By July of 1866, Carrington was busy with the construction of Fort Phil Kearney, which was to be the biggest in a chain of forts to protect the Bosman Trail. It was located in the northern portion of present-day Wyoming. Now, from this point forward, I'm going to go in a lot of details, because the bulk of this episode will be about this conflict between the Lakota on one side and Carrington and his soldiers on the other during 1866. We'll see also what happened right after to 1867, leading up to 1868, which will be the end of this long round of warfare. It does not mean the Lakota, Cheyenne on one side and US on the other will get along after this, but the bulk of the fighting will stop around 1868. That's still a couple of years away, though, so let's see what's going on in 1866. Um, I'm going to dedicate some extra time to the background of some of the characters involved, since we'll spend so much time on it. Now, one thing that Carrington was struggling with was just poor weaponry. He had asked for repeating rifles so that you can shoot multiple times, just press the trigger, shoot, press the trigger, shoot. But the War Department had not granted this request. They had actually argued that uh, single-shot Springfield rifles were much better because they would help cut down on uh, wasted ammunition since otherwise the soldiers would get too excited and waste ammunition by shooting too many, too many rounds in a row and not really aiming well. So they said, no, repeating rifles are really not that good. Single-shot rifles are much better. Well, this was a really thin excuse 
for the fact that quite a few politicians had been bribed by Springfield contractors, and that's why they were giving Springfield single-shot rifles to the army, even though they were clearly inferior weapons. Carrington was also struggling with morale among his men. Quite a few of them were not thrilled with working like dogs under the constant threat of Indian attacks, and so some of them would regularly desert in an effort to go strike luck in the Montana gold fields instead. Among the men that Carrington had under his command was a certain Jim Backward, who was the son of a Virginia slaveholder and his black mistress. So Jim was born in slavery, but he had been eventually granted freedom and had become a trapper out west. He had uh, cozied up with the Crow members of the Crow tribe and even married not just one, but two different Crow wives, and not sequentially, because we're not talking monogamy here. Uh, you know, he was married to these two women at the same time. As a result of Backward's good relationship with the Crow tribe, he actually tried to negotiate in favor of Carrington's with the tribe, to the point that some Crows were willing to volunteer their men to help Carrington. However, Carrington, A, didn't trust them. He wasn't so sure about, you know, Indians are Indians after all. Yes, the Crows don't like the Lakota, but can I really trust them? So he decided not to have them for that. Plus, he thought that it would make him look weak. Uh, if he accepted Indian help. Carrington's wife, named Margaret, was about 34 years old at this time, and she was pretty much the mother figure at the fort. Whereas her husband was not always respected by everybody, she was universally loved by, by everyone at the fort. Carrington also met with other native people, specifically Black Horse, as well as a few other peaceful Cheyenne leaders. There was a trading post that was owned by a French fur trader in the area, and the Cheyenne were going there to visit him, so Carrington decided to meet them. He had uh, there to translate for him a man by the name of Jim Bridger, who was another guy, you know, in addition to uh, uh, Jim Backward, which you mentioned a little bit ago. Jim Bridger was another one of the guys who served as a guide, as a translator for Carrington. And Jim Bridger by now was kind of a, an old legend of the West. If you guys have watched The Revenant, Jim Bridger is actually portrayed as this very young teenage guy who's one of the people who uh, uh, betrayed the main character played by Leonardo DiCaprio, but he's eventually forgiven due to his young age. That's actually a true story. That is indeed what happened in Bridger's younger days. But later in time, he became super famous for being this legendary trapper, guide, uh, uh, one of the, really the key figures of the West long before the West was colonized by the United States, long before those lands became states. Uh, Jim Bridger was out there. So Bridger was now helping Carrington to translate, and through Bridger, the Cheyenne leader said, look, we're unhappy about the soldiers coming north, but we have made a commitment to keeping the peace, so we're not going to fight against you guys. And they actually gave them some warnings about, look, there are other people within our tribe, as well as among the Lakota, who are hostile to you, you may want to watch out. Carrington, as a way of saying thank you for this commitment to keeping the peace, gave some of these leaders letters of safe passage, saying, I quote, When any Indian is seen who holds up this paper, he is to be treated kindly. So it was kind of a safe passage guarantee. As a way of saying thank you back, the Cheyenne leader Black Horse offered 100 of his warriors to help Carrington fight against the hostile uh, Lakota and Cheyenne which again it shows you how there was no unity among everybody within a tribe. Here you have one Cheyenne leader offering some of his own men to fight against other Cheyenne. But again, much like he had done in the case of the Crow, uh, Carrington said no. After this, the Cheyenne peace leaders decided to go visit the French fur trader in the area to see what he had to sell, what they could trade. 
But while they were there, they were met by some of the hostile Lakota, the ones who were at war with Carrington. They were quite mad about the fact that Black Horse and his friends had been so cozy with Carrington. So they promptly beat them up. They didn't kill them, they didn't do anything like that, but they showed their displeasure by beating up the peace chiefs, who kind of suffered his humiliation in silence, and then promptly packed their bags and headed south, away from this area of conflict. And conflict was indeed going on through the summer into the fall, as Lakota and Cheyenne would regularly launch little raids, you know, one day they would shoot one soldier who was standing guard, and another day they would come in and steal some of the livestock from the fort, and another day, you know, in other words, no big battles, but a constant source of annoyance, keeping the soldiers on their toes the whole time. On top of that, they would also raid any wagons using the Bosman Trail, to the point that by the fall of 1866, they had been successful in pretty much stopping almost all of the civilian traffic along the trail. By September 17th, a new officer joined the ranks of uh, Carrington staff. The 32-year-old Lieutenant George Grammond arrived along with his 21-year-old pregnant wife, Frances. Grammond had a rather complicated civil war record. There were regular complaints about him being drunk, there was a complaint about him shooting a fellow officer, pistol whipping another one, beating up soldiers under him, shooting an armed civilians. So, you know, not the kind of behavior that mm, the army was thrilled with. So he was court-martialed and was found guilty of shooting an officer and a civilian. However, despite the seriousness of the charge, he was only reprimanded. Nothing more than that. As the wagons that the Grammonts were traveling in, along with other soldiers, were getting to the fort, they were preceded into the fort by an ambulance. And again, ambulance picture, we're still talking wagons here, there's nothing else, but it was an ambulance wagon uh, coming from a short distance away from the fort. So Frances Grammont took a look inside to see what was going on, and she saw a naked body that had been decapitated, the head was rolling around the wagon with all the bumps in the road, with every bump the head would fall from one side of the wagon to the other. She saw that the body had been scalped, there was a tomahawk gash in the back which exposed the spine. Now, who was this guy? It turns out that this floating head and body belonged to a photographer named Ridgway Glover. Just a little bit earlier, when Lincoln had died, Glover's work in covering Lincoln's funeral procession had convinced the director of the Smithsonian Institute to send Glover out west to document, in their words, the taming of the frontier. People like uh, Glover, they thought he was a nice guy. A lieutenant at the fort by the name of Templeton described Glover as, I quote, a queer genius. However, the weird aspect of his personality was quite prominent. He would regularly wander the countryside, only carrying a knife, with no other weapons. And in this particular instance, earlier that day, he had been camping with some woodcutters who were working just a few miles away from the forest to chop down trees, to turn them into firewood that would then be used by all the men at the fort. So Glover was out there camping with them, and at one point he had decided to walk back the six miles separating him from the fort, completely on his own, and unarmed, because he didn't carry a gun. He had voiced multiple times his beliefs that the Lakota and Cheyenne would not attack him and would not harm him. Not entirely clear why he had this belief, but definitely entirely clear that this was a delusional belief, and he said rolling around the wagon was proof enough of this. By September 23rd, the soldiers at Fort Phil Kearney will score a minor victory. Captain Frederick Brown goes out with a few soldiers and manages to catch some of the raiding Lakota, Arapaho, and Cheyenne and, kill, and manage to kill a few warriors, about five or six of them, which may not sound like much, but considering that 
Up until now, natives have been able to just raid the fort anytime they wanted, steal livestock and run away. Is uh, you got to take your victories where you can. This is kind of the game they are playing all through the summer, all through the fall. On a daily basis, pretty much, native warriors raid the fort, either shooting a soldier or stealing some livestock or doing stuff basically to try to sabotage uh, and make difficult the life of soldiers at the fort. And the soldiers at the fort keep building, keep carrying on, keep trying to catch and retaliate when they can. So it's an ongoing game that they are playing back and forth. When he got back to the fort, Captain Brown reported from this September 23rd incident a rather curious event. He said that among the Indians he was fighting, he had seen a white man, dressed Indian style, was cussing at the soldiers in English, but was very much fighting as one of the natives. Who was this mystery guy? Well, it's actually not such a mystery. There were a few crows visiting the fort told the, the soldiers that there are actually quite a few white men who are living among the Arapaos and the Cheyenne, because they were probably fort traders who had married Indian women and basically lived as Indians. So it's interesting because, you know, we think these stories along racial lines, you know, the white guys against the Indians or that kind of stuff. It's always more complicated than that. It's never that simple. For Brown, however, it was this simple. He did have a very... Um, I'm trying to, I don't know if the word racist is correct. It's definitely a racial worldview where he believed, uh, um, I take that back, it is a racist worldview. <laughs> he did have this concept of white superiority and Indian inferiority. He did believe he considered himself and any white man superior to any Indian. He boasted numerous times that uh, he was just teaching for a chance to take scalps left and right because he felt that he could single-handedly take dozens of Indian scalps. Oddly enough, he had uh, recently been promoted to captain and he had received orders to be transferred to Fort Laramie, which was a safer and more prestigious location. But Brown had delayed and asked to stay at Fort Phil Kearney a little more because he had a curious obsession. He really wanted to be the one to take Red Cloud's scalp by himself. So he was, um, he did not want to go to a place that was safer. He wanted to stay at the one fort that was most often under attack, just so he would have a chance to fight more often and hopefully get to Red Cloud himself. This, however, his mood was not helped by the fact that on a pretty much daily basis, native warriors were able to steal horses and cows and other livestock from the fort and Brown was there frustrated, chasing them around, not catching them, and, you know, losing animals to an enemy that he considered inferior did not do wonders to his mood. Just a few days later, on September 27th, is the Indian time to strike. What happens here is that the soldiers at the fort, they had to deal with a bit of a problem. What had happened was that Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapa had been burning the grass close to the fort. So that meant that the soldiers would have to go further and further in order to cut hay for the horses. Not only that, but also they would have to go out and uh, cut trees for firewood. And since there weren't any close by to the fort, since they had been cut down for defensive purposes, that meant that on a fairly regular basis, groups of soldiers would have to go on this woodcutting detail that would often take them several miles away from the fort. And needless to say, this was a Christmas gift for the Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapa, who would uh, get to harass these few soldiers away from the main body. So in this one case, on September 27th, they attack yet again, and they look for some of the woodcutters that, have, uh, that got separated from the rest, and in this case, they found one, a soldier by the name of Patrick Smith. They shoot him up full of arrows, scalp him while he's still alive. He managed to break off the arrow shafts so that they wouldn't drag on the ground, and he crawled this way to the timber cutter's blockhouse. This, however, did not really help his long-term survival since he died of his wounds the next day. 
on that same day, um, Lakota and Cheyenne kill two more civilian woodcutters. So again, it's this game where you don't have a single big battle, but you have daily loss of life pretty much in this quick raid, kill one guy, run away. This is happening on an absolutely regular basis. Right about the same time, a group of peaceful Cheyenne stop by the fort, and um, Captain Brown ran into them just a few miles from the fort, led them back to the fort. The Cheyenne decided to just camp next to the fort for the night, but they had the bad timing of arriving and decided to camp there after the news of uh, Smith's horrible death had spread around. So quite a few soldiers inside the fort decided they wanted to go out and kill the Cheyenne at night. Not that they had anything to do with the death of their comrade. They were, again, yes, they were Cheyenne, but no, they were not part of the fighting, and if anything, they sympathized probably more with the soldier side, since, as we saw earlier, there were some Cheyenne who offered to fight on the soldier side. But emotions were running high, and in times like these, some of the soldiers just wanted to see Indian blood. Little did it matter whether it came from friendly or hostile Indians. Carrington, however, was not swept up in the same wave of bloodlust as some of his men, so he actually pulled out his gun and threatened to shoot anyone who dared attack the friendly Cheyenne. By the end of October, the construction at Fort Phil Kearney was completed. The stockade, the interior buildings, everything had been completed. So Carrington declared a holiday to celebrate the completion of the fort, and they had this ceremony where they uh, did the rising of the flag above the fort. No doubt natives in the surrounding hillside saw the rising of the flag and probably didn't take it well, because this to them was a symbolic gesture reminding them that a land that they claimed as theirs was now being claimed by the United States. Now, whose land it was is always tricky, because ultimately, you know, just a few years earlier, this was Crow land that the Lakota had stolen from the Crow, and now the U.S. was trying to steal it from the Lakota. But regardless, the Lakota felt, hey, we, we stole it fair and square, don't you dare steal it from us. So that's where they were. And they had, in all honesty, they had done everything they could to make life hell for everybody for Phil Kearney. It's estimated that they had, uh, throughout the summer and the early fall, they had probably stolen somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 livestock. They had killed quite a few soldiers and civilians. There was not a single civilian train that had reached the Montana gold fields without a fight, passing through the Bosman Trail. It's guerrilla warfare 101, really. This is like this ongoing, low-scale fighting that doesn't blow up in a single big battle, but is constant. On November 3rd, reinforcements arrived to the fort. Specifically, there were quite a few officers in this group. Uh, there was Lieutenant Horatio Bingham, Captain James Powell, and most importantly, a guy who was going to play a key role in the events about the struggle over Fort Phil Kearney. That's Captain William Fetterman. Fetterman was an interesting guy. He had tried to get into West Point earlier in his life, was not admitted, he had become a businessman, but due to the expansion of the army during the Civil War, he got his chance to finally be part of the army. He ended up participating in the Siege of Corinth in Mississippi, did very well in several battles, fought at Jonesboro, which was the prelude to the fall of Atlanta. So he kind of covered himself in glory and uh, made a big name for himself within the army. There's a bit of dispute regarding Fetterman's attitude about his new job on the frontier. Some accounts primarily push through Carrington, who will later write about Fetterman in copious details. They seem to portray Fetterman as this boastful, tough guy, kind of along the lines of Captain Brown, a guy who believed that, you know, in the words of some of Carrington's wives, I quote, he believed that a company of regulars could whip a thousand, and the regiment could whip a whole array of hostile tribes. So kind of nourishing this belief of the soldier superiority and how he could uh, just walk right through them. 
Other sources are not so sure about this, and but regardless, you know, Fetterman, regardless of his attitude, he's there to do his job, and his job is to fight Indians. Fighting Indians, though, was a bit of a problem since there were only 400 soldiers at Fort Phil Kearney, and even though Carrington's superiors urged him to launch search and destroy missions to find the warriors' camps and attack them, Carrington simply did not have enough soldiers to do that. So what Fetterman, Brown, Grammond, and a few other guys decided to do after receiving Carrington's permission was to Along with about 50 men, they would set up an ambush. So they would leave some mules outside of the fort in order to tempt the natives to come down and try to steal them. But in the meantime, they would hide nearby, ready to pounce on the natives the second they showed up to try to steal the mules. Lakota Cheyenne and the Rapa warriors, however, were not stupid and figured out what was up. They understand that there was a trap going on. So Fetterman, Brown and company, they sit there, freezing themselves, waiting, while in the meantime, the natives go on the other side of the fort and steal a herd from the opposite side. So it did not quite work out to the way they wanted. On December 3rd, 1866, President Johnson delivered a State of the Union address. He gave an hour-long speech thanking an all-wise and merciful providence for helping bring back the nation together, and that was really the bulk of his speech, was about kind of the unity of the United States following the Civil War. It was a fairly long speech, some 7,000 plus words. Only 38 of them were dedicated to what was going on on the frontier. But in Johnson's view, everything was fine on the frontier. I'm going to quote from his State of the Union speech. He said, Treaties have been concluded with the Indians, who, enticed into armed opposition to our government at the outbreak of the rebellion, have unconditionally submitted to our authority and manifested an earnest desire for a renewal of friendly relations. In other words, you know, this... Indians gave us a little bit of trouble, and yes, they steered up and they did some fighting, but now they, again I quote, submitted, uh, sorry, unconditionally submitted to our authority, and now are ready to do business with us. Well, apparently the Lakota and Cheyenne camped close to Fort Phil Kearney must have not gotten the memo here, because just three days later, Hundreds of them left their camp by the Tongue River, where the majority of them were staying. This was located about 70 miles north of the fort, to mount a major offensive against the fort. And this is where the first of the big December fights that will pit the soldiers at Fort Phil Kearney against the Lakota and Cheyenne will take place. Braving freezing temperatures, this large contingent of Lakota and Cheyenne made their way through icy creeks, through really rough terrain, to come up right next to the fort, waiting for the wood train to leave the fort, carrying some soldiers, and to promptly attack it. So right away, upon finding out that some of their men were under attack, a column of soldiers under Fetterman and Bingham led the cavalry, about 50 some men left the fort leading cavalry support to the woodcutters. And at the same time, Carrington and Grammond would lead a few more men trying to get behind the attacking Indians. This pincher move does not work the way it was designed to. First and foremost, because Grammond disobeys Carrington's orders and just darts forwards with a few men breaking up the line, you know, only a few men remain with Carrington, several others are all chasing after Grammond, who's chasing after Indians. Carrington can't quite figure out what's going on by now, because he's sort of staying behind compared to where the main action is taking place. A few minutes later, the soldiers united, Fetterman and his guys arrived where Carrington was, and even Grammond makes his way back. Reporting Kind of with the tail between his legs, he reports that things did not go quite as planned. Surprise, surprise. Well, what had happened is that he and some of his men had chased down a lonely Indian that they found. 
And some of the versions of the story say that the native they were chasing was actually Crazy Horse himself. Not everybody agrees with it, but it's a possibility at least. So they were chasing down this man and realized a little too late that the man was just acting as a decoy, trying to lead them into an ambush, which promptly worked, and so he led them into this area where other warriors were waiting, who jumped out and attacked them. Lieutenant Bingham was killed and scalped. Sergeant Bowers was taken down from his horse and was killed with tomahawks and knives. Carrington decided, well, we can't leave their bodies out there, so we need to go find them. And they did find Bowers, who was actually still alive, despite the fact that he had a split skull. He's not going to stay alive much longer, so they see him kind of die in front of them. Bingham had over 50 arrows stuck in him, I guess, while they were killing him and afterwards, some of the people on the native side got a little overexcited and pumped 50 arrows into his body. Fetterman couldn't quite figure out what had happened because he knew Lieutenant Bingham as an excellent officer and he could not understand why he made such a rookie mistake of getting overexcited and chasing a group of natives when he did not know how many were out there. In Fetterman's own words, he said, I cannot account for the movement of such an officer of such unquestionable gallantry. Which in other words means, I don't know how he, why he acted in such a stupid way. He should have known better than that. So Captain Powell now replaced the dead Bingham as a cavalry commander. Brown again had been told that he was scheduled to leave for Fort Laramie the day after Christmas, but he was stolen since he liked fighting and had been successful back in, back in September. So what he wanted was to make the best use of his time here and wanted to go on offensive and attack an Indian village. Carrington told him, you're crazy, we just don't have enough men for an operation of that magnitude, that's just not gonna happen. Brown, however, just kind of stormed off all mad and he had told the Fetterman, he believed, I can kill 10 Indians by myself. I just need the chance. And as it turns out, he will soon have his chance. Because the first fight was over. But a second, much bigger fight, which in case you haven't realized by now, that's what this whole episode essentially is about, is the struggle, is the conflict over Fort Phil Kearney and the Bosman Trail is all about. Well, the second fight, the biggest one of this whole story, is about to happen very soon. Carrington's guide and legendary mountain man Jim Bridger had a bit of a different assessment compared to Captain Brown regarding the soldiers' skills in fighting Indians. In his own words, he declared, these soldiers don't know anything about fighting Indians. By December 21st, the Lakota and Cheyenne decided to try their luck again, this time bringing an even bigger group of warriors, so as to be able to deal with any size contingent of soldiers sent after them. So bundled up in their winter coats, possibly something in the neighborhood of 1,500 warriors left their camps and went after the fort. The plan was to lure the soldiers away from the fort and have them fall into an ambush, waiting about four or five miles away from the gates of the fort. Before they even got going and got the whole thing started, they sent out a man who was, uh, I guess you can refer to him as a medicine man, to basically pray for success uh, for the day's operation. The man was what the Lakota referred to as a winkte. A winkte was a man who had received the vision that he was to live his life as a woman. In the culture of the Lakota, as well as in the culture of many other native tribes, actually, there were more than two recognized gender. Yes, there were men, yes, there were women, but there was also the idea of uh, what sometimes in native cultures are referred to as two spirits, people who have been born with the body of a certain gender, but they also have a spirit that is of the opposite gender. So he's somebody that, like the guy in this case, may be living his life as a woman even though born a man. 
this often goes also with the whole concept of homosexuality that was fairly commonly accepted among many native tribes. Not among everybody, I'm not trying to overgeneralize, but definitely was uh, uh, among the Lakota in this case. It was something that did happen, was recognized, wasn't seen as a big deal. And in this case, somebody could even be recognized as having an important religious role. This guy in particular was sent out to pray for the success of the day's raid. After going up the hill to pray, he came back to the main body of awaiting warriors, saying that the spirits had told him that they were going to be able to catch ten soldiers on that day. And the warriors said, not enough. You know, we came here, there are so many of us, we want a bigger battle than this. So he went back to pray, came back saying, I have twenty soldiers. Warriors said, not enough, try again. He went back to pray, came back, said, the spirits promised us 50 soldiers. Said, nope, not, not enough yet. So on the fourth time, he came back, and as he was riding his way back to the awaiting warriors, he looked like he was staggering under this heavy weight. And he hopped off his horse, dropped his hands to the ground, and said, quick, tell me, I hold a hundred soldiers in my hands. Is that enough? Can we tell the spirits this is okay? And everybody approved, say, yes, that's enough. That's good. This is why, from the native side, this battle that's about to begin will be known as the hundred in the hand. The hundred in the hand is a reference to this man coming back promising, hey, I hold these hundred soldiers in the hand. Are they enough? Are you going to take it or not? So that's what it's about. This same fight will be referred to usually as the Fetterman fight in uh, American Chronicles. As it turns out, the spirits could have used some extra work at math because they are not going to be a hundred soldiers, it's going to be 81, but, you know, close enough. Even though the natives will hold a dramatic numerical superiority in this battle, their weaponry could have used some improvement. It's estimated that less than 10% of them had any kind of firearm. Almost everybody was armed with bows and arrows and tomahawks and stuff like that. White Bull was a relative of the renowned leader Sitting Bull, and he participated in this battle. He reported later that he went with a bow and 40 arrows plus a spear. And even the arrows, it's kind of funny, like his uh, White Bull's own father had made the iron arrowheads from a frying pan that he had. So these were, to say the least, improvised weaponry. In any case, so what happens is, yet again, like they had done time and time before, the natives attack the soldiers who are on wood detail, who are out to cut wood. So Carrington promptly ordered Powell to lead the relief column, and... Uh, According to Carrington, Fetterman pulled the rank and said, I want to be the leader, I want to be the one leading the column. And so Carrington had agreed, but he said, your job is only to provide relief to the wood train. Once the Indians turn away, you are not to follow them on the trail. And supposedly Carrington was worried that Fetterman and Grandmond were a bit over-aggressive, so he gave specific orders that said, I quote, support the wood train, relieve it, and report to me. Do not engage or pursue Indian at its expense. Under no circumstances pursue over the ridge, lodge trail ridge. So his direction was, hey, just provide some help to the soldiers there, but do not chase them. So Fetterman and Grammond took command and led a total of 81 men, including a few civilians, on the chase. Brown, of course, didn't want to miss a chance to fight, so he went out too, since he was itching for his occasion to try to take scalps. Almost immediately after Fetterman left, the signal came from the woods indicating that the attack against the wood train was over. So the fact that Carrington did not send a messenger after Fetterman trying to recall the force means that he probably was okay with the changing plans and with Fetterman crossing the ridge to see what was going on. Probably Carrington, like everyone else, expected a hundred or so Indians, the way it had been in the previous occasions. So he figured, oh, okay, maybe they can have a little bit of a battle, but 
nobody expected the nearly 2,000 who were awaiting for them a few miles away. So Fetterman, not knowing what the numbers involved were, was probably trying to cut them off. And, you know, he and Graham would do the split and they would try to catch them and surround them and try to attack them. Now, I haven't forgotten that this podcast series is supposedly about Crazy Horse. Now, the first episode was largely about Crazy Horse. The next are going to be almost entirely about Crazy Horse. This one, I understand, I'm really more covering the Lakota-US conflict, the Crazy Horse specifically, simply because we don't know in detail what kind of role Crazy Horse played. There's even a debate regarding his role in, uh, in this particular fight. Some sources attribute a key role to Crazy Horse. Others are not so convinced. But let's go with the first version, the one that has Crazy Horse playing a big role in this. The story goes that Crazy Horse led a group of about 10 Lakota, Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors to act as decoys. Uh, what they did basically was attack the wood train and stay within sight of Fetterman and Grammond, so that Fetterman and Grammond would lead their 81 men to chase them. And according to this tale, Crazy Horse and these guys pulled every trick in the book to make the soldiers feel that they had a chance to catch up. They had to play kind of a dangerous game, because on one hand they had to make it look like they were running from their lives away from the soldiers, but on the other hand, if they realized that they were gaining too much ground, and that meant that the soldiers may give up the chase, feeling that it wasn't worth it, that they were losing them, then Crazy Horse and this man would have to sort of, with the other end, slow down the horse and start making all sorts of excuses for why they were going so slow. So in some cases, they made it look like their horses were tired. Crazy Horse supposedly even hopped on his horse and checked to see if his horse was wounded, and uh, look under the horse's hoofs and did all these things that basically make the soldiers feel like this guy is done, his horse is spent, it's exhausted, we just need to chase him a little further and we'll have him. So the soldiers were excited, they were drunk on the ecstasy of the hunt, they were ready to close in on their prey, when all of a sudden they start hearing war whoops all around them and the ground surrounding them comes alive as hundreds of Lakota and Cheyenne warriors spring out from their hiding spots and they see them in front of them, they see them to their left, they see them to their right, they see them behind them. There's well over a thousand of them and that's when they know, that's when the soldiers know that they screwed up. Crazy Horse had led them into a trap and now the trap was sealed. They were fully in the kill zone. So their confidence turns to panic as they realize that the trap is set, they have fallen in the middle of it, and now they are going to have to fight their way out if they are gonna see the end of this day. Now that the trap was set, all the Lakota, Cheyenne and the Rapa warriors got onto their horses and started charging. Now the whole area sounded like thunder because of the horse's hooves. War cries were everywhere and they must have terrified Fettersman men, realizing that they were surrounded. To make matters worse, the soldiers were not even in just a single unified body because there was the cavalry had gone further ahead into the trap, the infantry had stayed further behind, so they are like two or three separate fights taking place, not even within sight of each other as uh, little groups of soldiers will dismount, take cover behind some rocks, and try to fight against the incoming Indians. In a desperate move, the cavalry even let their horses go, hoping that the Indians would get distracted by them and chase them, but they didn't. Rather than just launching this frontal attack against the soldiers, initially, Lakota and Cheyenne started shooting up arrows in an arc in the sky to just basically kill as many soldiers as possible before they move in to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Turns out that this tactic 
It worked because it did kill a lot of soldiers, but it also called the some friendly fire as some of these arrow killed some Lakota and Cheyenne men who had gone further than the others. But after a big volley of arrows, the Lakota and Cheyenne decided to charge and bring the fight to a hand-to-hand -hand level. In the middle of the fight, Grammond managed to cut a warrior's head off with his saber before being killed by the Cheyenne with arrows. The Lakota charged mostly against the infantry. After Grammond was killed, the cavalry retreated to where the infantry was and they rejoined forces. According to some sources, Crazy Horse led the charge against them, using his tomahawk in the fight against the soldiers. Here is what happens in the fight, in the words of one of the Lakota warriors who participated in it, a man by the name of Fire Thunder, which, as native names go, that's a badass name right there. Fire Thunder said, There were many bullets, but there were more arrows, so many that it was like a cloud of grasshoppers all above and around the soldiers. The soldiers were falling all the while they were fighting back up the hill, and their horses got loose. Many of our people chased the horses, but I was not after horses. I was after the Washikos. When the soldiers got on top, there were not many of them left, and they had no place to hide. They were fighting hard. We were told to crawl up on them, and we did. When we were close, someone yelled, Let us go. This is a good day to die. Think of the helpless ones at home. Then we all cried, Hokahe, and rushed at them. Incidentally, Hokahe is the Lakota battle cry that stands for Today is a good day to die. Let's go. And again in the words of Fire Thunder, I was young then and quick on my feet, and I was one of the first to get in among the soldiers. They got up and fought very hard, until not one of them was alive. The last minutes of the soldiers' lives were probably very dramatic. Captain Brown, the man who had uh, boasted about killing Indians and all this, his body was later found with, uh, with a bullet hole in the side of his head in what looked like suicide. It looked like he had shot himself rather than uh, being killed by Indians. Brown's obsession with scalps clearly had not served him well. He probably would have done better being transferred to Fort Laramie. His dream of collecting Indian scalps only had that it with him putting a bullet in his own head instead. Fetterman, well, Fetterman did not meet a much better death. Um, a Lakota warrior by the name of American Horse charged his own horse into Fetterman's horse, knocking him down, and then jumped off the horse, hit him with a war club. Fetterman was now dazed as American Horse pulled out his knife and cut his throat. Carrington, in the meantime, hearing these noises of battle from a few miles away, had sent another officer with more soldiers to go check up on what was going on and provide assistance. The second group of soldiers rushed up the ridge, and when they got to the top, they saw something that froze the blood in their veins. They saw somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 warriors who looked up saw these new groups of soldiers and started taunting them, just inviting them to come down the hill and fight. None of the soldiers could see any sign of Fetterman. So the message that they sent back was that we can't find Fetterman anywhere. And then, again, I quote from the message sent back to Carrington, the Indians are on the road, challenging to come down. The captain is afraid Fetterman's party is all gone up, sir. So these were probably not the news that Carrington wanted to receive. Now, one advantage that this second group of soldiers had is that they had wagons with them, so many of the natives were afraid that they carried cannons in the wagons, so they started retreating a little bit. The entire battle had lasted less than 45 minutes. All 81 soldiers were dead. The natives lost a few people. Estimates for their losses are not entirely clear. The majority of them were actually killed by their own arrows. Among the wounded was uh, Nicholas Black Elk father, 
the man that I've referred to earlier as the subject of the book Black Elk Speaks. His father had broken his leg during the battle and had remained uh, a bit lame for the rest of his life. In the meantime, now that the battle was over, back at the fort, some of the soldiers and the women at the fort were staring at the horizon, looking for signs of what happened, hoping to see their comrades or their husbands or some of the other soldiers come back, and yet they heard or saw nothing. In the words of uh, Grandmont's wife, Frances, the silence was dreadful. The second group of soldiers that had gone out of the fort start trying to recover the bodies from the battlefield once the natives have retreated, but they can only load some of them on the wagons before the day comes to an end and nightfall is coming. So they decide, well, we don't want to stay here at night, let's leave quickly. What they saw when they went to recover the bodies was troubling, to say the least. It's safe to say that it's probably something that lived in their nightmares for years to come. Many of the Cheyenne women had come onto the battlefield the second the battle was over to mutilate the dead soldiers as payback for Sand Creek. All the Cheyenne who had been killed at Sand Creek, they were mutilated by the Colorado militia in the most horrific ways. The Cheyenne women decided to return the favor. So, Everybody, well, I won't go into all the graphic gory details, but you can imagine, you know, limbs chopped off, uh, brains bashed out, you know, the whole range of things that's pretty heavy, nasty stuff. Now, post-mortem mutilation of enemies was typical of plain Indian warfare, no doubt about it. But unlike what is claimed in a really terrible book that I read recently when researching this episode, there's a book called The Heart of Everything That Is, that's supposed to be this uh, new biography of Red Cloud. And the reason why I say it's a terrible book is because they kind of make up a lot of things along the way. It's really sort of, it's amazing that something that plainly distorts history can be published at all and actually be successful. Now, what is specifically that I'm disagreeing with about? Well, they make it sound like torture of captives was the norm in plain Indian warfare. It wasn't. You know, post-mortem mutilation, yes, it was. Torture of captives is something that you find much more in the culture of the Eastern Woodlands tribes, not nearly as much onto the Great Plains. But in any case, not that there were any captives, because everybody had been killed right then and there during the battle in this case. One man whose body was found was a young German soldier by the name of Adolf Metzger, was in charge of the bugle, the bugle being an instrument that was used to pass commands from the officers to the soldiers. He was found between two rocks. He had clearly fired his gun against the incoming Indians until he had no more ammunition. And then all he had left to fight with was his bugle and they used it to fight. Apparently the story goes that the Lakota and Cheyenne were so impressed with this man's bravery to fight despite overwhelming odds, that he was the only soldier in the entire field whose body had not been mutilated, because the Lakota and Cheyenne had been very impressed. They said, no, this guy is too brave, was fought very honorably, so they did not scalp him, they did not mutilate him. He's the only man in, out of all of 81 who uh, was not mutilated post-mortem. He was actually covered with a buffalo robe, now, some of the Lakota guys brought a buffalo robe there and covered his body with it as a sign of honoring him. It's kind of weird when you think about it. Here you have warriors who just killed you, who decide to protect your body and actually do the closest that they can to a burial given the circumstances. Once the battle of, was over again, the scene must have been dreadful. There was paper flying everywhere maps, journals, letters, everything that the soldiers had been carrying with them was now flying up in the air. There were dead horses as well as dead men all over the place. This was a field day for coyotes and crows. Crows, in this case, I'm referring to the bird, not at the members of the crow tribe. Coyotes and crows and ravens kind of came down onto the battle and started just eating everything they could find. So here you have this visual of, you know, scavengers 
taking pieces out of the mutilated bodies. This was like, if you have ever seen a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, who's this amazing artist who painted some really disturbing scenes, but in beautiful fashion, well, the reality of the battlefield, once it was over, does remind me of something that would come out of the imagination of Hieronymus Bosch. Some sources tell us that Crazy Horse and I Backbone realized that their friend Lone Bear wasn't with them, so they later returned to the battlefield to look for him, and they found him, dying but not yet dead, so they stayed with him, kind of weeping and holding him until he finally died. Back at the fort, everybody was scared. Carrington released some of the prisoners from the jail and gave them guns because they were expecting an all-out attack against the fort. In the next morning, Carrington and some of his men went out of the fort and went back to the battlefield to see what had happened and to try to recover more bodies. Carrington's instruction to Powell, who was the officer he left back at the fort, were as follows. If in my absence, Indians in overwhelming numbers attack, put the women and children in the magazine with supplies of water, bread, crackers, and other supplies that seem best. And in the event of a last desperate struggle, destroy altogether, rather than have any captured alive. And before leaving, he also turned to Frances Grammond and told her, Mrs. Grammond, I shall go in person and will bring back to you the remains of your husband. And he did keep his word. When he came back, he actually gave her a lock of her husband's hair and did what he could in that regard. But regardless, fear was the dominant force at the fort in the following days. If you can personify fear, fear was ruling over all of them. Frances Grammond wrote this. During the nights, I would dream of Indians of being captured and carried away by Red Cloud himself, while frantically screaming for help. So, not only the reality that they had to deal with during daylight was terrifying, but Indians had managed to even invade their nightmares, so that their nights were populated with them as well. In trying to bury in these frozen bodies, clearly wasn't easy because of rigor mortis, because they were frozen and all of them. There were particular problems with some of them. In particular, Captain Brown, one of the men preparing his body, said the following. The privates of Captain Brown were severed and placed in his mouth, and considering the extreme cold weather, they could not be extracted. So he had to actually to be buried that way. This was the same man who had been obsessed about taking Lakota scalps. In the meantime, back at the Lakota and Cheyenne camp on the Tongue River, they had three days of mourning for the warriors who had died, and then at the end of the three days they had a big feast to celebrate the victory. Once news of this defeat leaked to the outside world, the press was quick to label this the Fetterman Massacre, well, technically it wasn't really a massacre since there was no... This was armed forces fighting other armed forces. There were no sort of innocent civilians caught in the middle. But, you know, back in the 1800s, the press was usually quick to label a massacre any time American forces lost, regardless of the specific circumstances. On December 21st, Carrington had paid two civilians to take a report to the Horseshoe Station, which was located 190 miles away. So these two men, by the name of John Phillips and Daniel Dixon, had the rather unpleasant task of riding through Indian country for almost 200 miles in freezing weather to bring the news of what happened to the outside world. After reaching the Horseshoe Station, Phillips then continued alone for 40 more miles to Fort Laramis. Phillips had all in all, he rode 236 miles in four days through blizzards to bring the news of what had happened to Fort Laramie. With unfortunate timing, he arrived at 11 p.m. on Christmas night. At the officers' quarters, they were having a big dance, they were enjoying a dress-up ball. And Lieutenant David Gordon, 
who was stationed there, wrote the following. It was on Christmas night, 11 p.m., when a full-dress ball was progressing and everyone appeared superlatively happy, enjoying the dance, notwithstanding the snow, was from 10 to 15 inches deep on the level and the thermometer indicated 25 degrees below zero, when a huge form dressed in a buffalo overcoat, accompanied by an orderly, desired to see the commanding officer. The dress of the man, and at this hour looking for the commanding officer, made a deep impression upon the officers and others that happened to get a glimpse of him, and consequently and naturally too excited their curiosity as to his mission in this strange garb, dropping into our full-dress garrison ball at this unseasonable hour. Well, the news of what happened quickly bring the party to an end and make everybody give up on the dancing and everybody went back to their quarters with a heavy heart. The reaction to this dramatic defeat of the U.S. Army was, well, what you may expect. General Sherman wrote to Ulysses Grant, who was going to become President of the United States the following year, We are not going to let a few thriving, ragged Indians stop progress. We must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even to their extermination, men, women, and children. He later stated that he wanted ten dead Indians for every white man who had died. And again, quoting from uh, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's words, It is not necessary to find the very men who committed the acts, but destroy all of the same breed. Sherman, however, was not to have his way, at least not any time soon. Part of the problem was that some people, kind of the higher-ups in the army, much like Sherman, wanted war. But many politicians did not, because they were running out of money. And so they figured that maybe there was a better way to go about it. Now, the army considered the politicians corrupt. The politicians considered the army bloodthirsty and ineffective. So eventually, when Ulysses Grant became president in 1868, he decided to remove control of Indian reservation from the military and give it instead to churches. So in some way, political opportunism created what would become known as Grant's peace policy. The switch to a peace policy happened because war was simply costing too much, and already so much money was going into reconstruction that the government simply did not have money to spend in all directions. Now, in much of the eastern portion of the United States, people agreed with this idea of maybe we should give up this war in the plains. In the West, not so much. There's an instance where a senator from Wisconsin named James Doolittle, who was a peace advocate, was giving this speech at this Denver Opera House, and he asked what he thought was a rhetorical question. He said, should the Indians be civilized on reservations were exterminated, clearly implying, of course, we're going to get our way by civilizing them, and it's the humane Christian thing to do. But the audience drowned the rest of his speech with screams of exterminate them, exterminate them, exterminate them. So as a result of this uh, Fetterman fight, the government in 1867 created what was known as the Indian Peace Commission, to find out the causes of Indian hostility, which is a joke when you think about it, because it's like, what do you think are the causes? Is that maybe you are invading their land and these guys are mad? Well, clearly, I mean, and I'm not even making a moral argument about, oh, bad United States invading Indian land, because again, as we saw, Lakotas have been invading Crow land, or, but let's not be hypocritical about it. Like, this whole fight is about land, is about who gets to own these uh, valuable portions of real estate. So some of the fighting continued. It didn't go quite as well for the native side. Like in August 1867, there was what would become known as the wagon box fight. It was an instance in which large numbers of Lakota and Cheyenne, including some of the big players, Crazy Horse, Red Cloud, High Backbone, and all of these guys, they attacked a group of soldiers, but some young warriors spoiled the ambush by attacking too early. So the soldiers 
circled up their wagons and started shooting at the incoming Indians. Now, this shouldn't have been a problem for the natives, except that they were in for a surprise. The soldiers now had the latest Springfield 1866 model, which, unlike the previous guns that they are faced, that they were single-shot muzzle-reloading rifles, these ones were repeating rifles. So the speed at which the soldiers could shoot was dramatically increased. So even though the natives did kill a few soldiers, many more of them died in this attack, probably well over 50. Crazy Horse managed to kill a soldier and grab from him one of these new repeating action rifles, but overall the battle was not exactly a success for the Lakota side. In the War of Fire Thunder, there were not many Washikos, but they were lying behind the boxes and they shot faster than they ever shot at us before. So the lack of command structure, lack of a coordinated plan, didn't lead to a big success for the native side, for sure. It was actually a defeat. It would be five years until the next time the crazy horse would fight against American troops again. Now, while all of this was happening, the Union Pacific Transcontinental Railroad was being built across Nebraska, and this made the Bosman Trail somewhat irrelevant since people could go around using the, the railway stations to reach the gold fields in Montana. So there was still tremendous Indian hostility along the Bosman Trail, uh, but now there was another way to get to Montana, so the government started thinking that maybe they could close the Bosman Trail. By 1867, they had already decided that Bosman Trail was too unsafe, and eventually they decided to close it down. The forts, it had been proven by now in obvious fashions, were not able to protect the trail. So the government decided to close the trail to the public. So by this point, the only thing you have along the trail are these forts with soldiers that are stationed there to protect the trail that nobody's using. So they're really only there to protect themselves by now. So the obvious realization is that there's no more point for their presence guarding a road that's no longer used. So by 1868, the Bosman Trail is formally closed and all the forts are abandoned. This goes hand in hand with a renewed effort at peace that the government was making, which will lead to one of the most important treaties ever signed between native tribes and the US government, this being the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. The commission in charge of negotiating with the tribes was prepared to give in to Indian demands. What makes this treaty unique is that, unlike what happened time and time again, this is a treaty that the native side will sign from a position of strength. The US, at this time, the government does not want the war to continue. They wasted too much money, they wasted too much energy to get no result. So they are willing to make a bunch of concessions to the native side just so that the war can end. This is clearly not a typical scenario of what normally happens in treaties between the US government and Indian tribes. The idea was to slowly try to convince native side to adapt, to abandon the buffalo hunting lifestyle, adopting agriculture. The government would provide schools so that native kids would learn to speak English. Uh, but more importantly, from the native standpoint, they would provide supplies for many years to come, and they guaranteed that they basically acknowledge native sovereignty over a big chunk of land that encompassed most of uh, South Dakota. The state of South Dakota, a big chunk of it, pretty much all of western South Dakota was to be Lakota and Cheyenne land. Plus, they would also have hunting rights in some of the surrounding lands in Montana, Wyoming, and so on. Now, the treaty as treaty goes was tricky. One of the things that happened is that the people in charge of the commissions were trying to convince Lakota and Cheyenne leaders to sign. They are going to only translate those parts of the treaty that sound very appealing, that the natives would be happy with, and the parts that are not quite as advantageous to the tribes will be conveniently forgotten and nobody mentioned them. In the words of native man named Bear in the Grass. He later, when he found out what the actual Fort Laramie Treaty said in full, he stated, 
these words of the treaty were never explained. It was said that the treaty was for peace and friendship with the whites. When we took hold of the pen, they said that they would take the troops away so we could raise our children. And Red Cloud, similarly a couple of years later, will state, We thought the treaty was just to remove the forts and for us to cease from fighting. So what the native side understand is the U.S., the government is tired of fighting. They want us to stop fighting against them, and in exchange, they are going to give us what we want, which is recognition of our homeland. They would destroy the forts, and they would stay out of our lives, which from their point of view is we want the war and we got what we want. Well, some elements of these were in the treaty, but not all of them. Like, for example, as they were negotiating, when the commissioners were beginning to get a few of the peace chiefs to sign, others were staying, like Red Cloud message to the commissioners was, we're on the mountains looking down on the soldiers and the forts. When we see the soldiers moving away and the forts abandoned, then I will come down and talk. So he said, look, destroy the forts and then we are talking, you know, leave our land and sure, I'll sign whatever you want, which is exactly what's going to happen. Eventually, uh, by November, Red Cloud will sign the treaty, the forts will be abandoned. Very quickly, a group of Lakota and Cheyenne will come down and set the forts on fire. So all this big giant fight for which hundreds of people had lost their lives was essentially for nothing from the U.S. standpoint. They had to give up on this plan of holding military presence in the area. And you can imagine probably the emotions of the Lakota and Cheyenne. They, from their point of view, they won the war. They had obtained what they wanted. They kicked the soldiers out, destroyed the forts. And so up in flames, the fort went and the natives felt we did it. We were successful at holding on to our homeland. Now the treaty, as treaty goes, present one problem, which is that if you look at the 400 odd treaties that were signed and ratified by the Senate, they were signed between the US government and native tribes, you would be hard pressed to find too many of those that were kept, where eventually they were not broken. So yes, in 1868, the treaty signed, the US on one side and Lakota and Cheyenne on the other will end this long round of warfare that they've been engaged in. But as we're going to see, despite the promises contained in the treaty of eternal peace between the two opposing factions, this was not going to last. In the words of Nicholas Black Elk, they made a treaty with Red Cloud that said our country would be ours as long as grass should grow and water flow. You can see that it's not the grass and the water that I've forgotten. You know, this promise of eternal peace turns out that forever, as the treaty was supposed to last, forever will mean six years, because with six years the treaty will be broken and conflict on a much larger scale between the US and the tribes will begin again. And Crazy Horse, well, we're going to go back to Crazy Horse starting in the next episode, see what's going on with very dramatic events that take place in his life before even the treaty will be broken, you know, the all the period of intertribal warfare, romantic affairs, all sort of stuff is going to happen in his life. But once war with the US will begin again, Crazy Horse is going to play as big a, as a role as any Lakota you can find anywhere. Things are about to get, if at all possible, even more heated. <laughs>